Just before we start, to say a great big thank you to all of the top tier patrons and channel members that choose to support me here on this channel, you'll all be receiving a cool little gift this month. The top tier channel members will receive a limited edition Star Wars 50p depicting C-3PO and R2-D2 that comes sealed within a nice little booklet, and the top tier patrons will all be receiving a limited edition £2 coin produced to commemorate the 50 years since Tolkien's passing, and it features his monogram. It's an absolutely gorgeous coin, again, this comes sealed within a booklet. So to the top tier channel members, please contact me via Instagram or Twitter, you'll find the those linked down in the description. Alternatively, you can also check the community tab here on my YouTube page. And patrons, I'll be sending you a direct message, so keep your eyes open on your inbox for that, because I'll obviously have to find some way of sending them to you. Once again, to each and every one of you, thank you very much, and let's get on with the video, shall we? Ahsoka Episode 3 is here, and it begins with a training sequence. Okay, nothing wrong with that, except, once again, really drawn out. You know, if you're not going to make any major plot developments within a scene, particularly an introduction, that needs to be the shortest, snappiest section to get the audience right back into it. Instead, we sit there and watch Ahsoka walk around in circles, tapping Sabine with a wooden stick while she's wearing a visor for five whole minutes. I showed you in the last review how long three minutes can feel, and let me tell you, an extra two ain't all that fun. And once again, before you start saying, oh, Johnny, you're just being pernickety as always. Let's just take a quick look at a scene from A New Hope, and we'll contrast that with this scene from Ahsoka, as they both have similar inflections. The scene from A New Hope is about three minutes long, and in that time, Alderaan has been destroyed, and although not sure exactly what, Old Ben can sense misfortune thanks to his rapport with the Force. I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. This introduces to us, the audience, the idea that the Force can extend beyond oneself. This then seamlessly leads into Luke's training with the visor on, where we learn that you can tune your sensitivity to the Force. And in the meantime, Han Solo is also establishing to us, the audience, what's just happened and where we're heading. Forget your troubles with those Imperial slugs. I told you I'd outrun them. Don't everybody thank me at once. Anyway, we should be at all around about 0200 hours. And we also have time for a spot of holographic chess banter. And we also have some great character dynamics where Han and Ben play devil and angel for Luke, the believer and the pessimist. The actual scene of Luke training with the droid is no longer than a minute, and the other two minutes surrounding that consist of character development, world building, and plot propulsion. And now contrast that training scene from A New Hope with this one in Ahsoka, and they're not too dissimilar. Very similar roles are being played by different characters. The older, more experienced Jedi guiding the younger, more naive, in the ways of the Force by blindfolding. Except this scene in Ahsoka establishes absolutely nothing other than Sabine's a bit rusty, isn't she? Whereas the shorter, more effective scene from A New Hope had world building, character development, plot propulsion, comedy, and a couple of great quotes. I see your point, sir. I suggest a new strategy, R2. Let the Wookiee win. I'm not sat here crying that Star Wars can do better. I'm saying they already have done. And look, I know that a handful of fans of the animated shows are getting very disgruntled with what people have to say online about Ahsoka. But the fact is, just because that show is referencing other good shows doesn't make this new show a good show as well. That's just not the way the world works. You know, diamonds are prized for their rarity, sure, but also their density and their strengths. You can look at a piece of zirconium and say, hey, look, that, that, that's nice and shiny, just like that diamond over there. I remember that diamond. But the thing is, if you look a little bit closer, that detail ain't going to be quite there. You stick a cubic zirconium to a drill bit, it ain't going to work too well, is it? What I'm saying is, two things might look nice and shiny, but that doesn't mean they're built of the same stuff, does it? I also find it quite funny how Sabine's biceps literally double in size while she's wearing the visor. Hmm, how, how very mysterious. Very impressive, but an ability some might consider to be unnatural. She's taking steroid. No, uh, it's just one of the slightly less subtle stunt doubles I've ever seen. Stunt double in this instance, meaning the person performing the stunts is literally double the size of the original actress. Hey, got him. This scene does remind me that the A-Wing is the best Star Wars ship, bar none. Tip of the cap to any fellow A-Wing enjoyers. Very cultured decision. I do want to give props where it's due. And I do want to praise the makers of Ahsoka for not, at least immediately, falling into the trap of the Mary Sue, as Sabine is actually having to work, train, and overcome failure before she begins to master her use of the Force. However, it would be nice if they didn't season that dish with a load of nonsense like this. Historically, there have been very few Mandalorians who ever became a Jedi. I don't need Sabine to be a Jedi. 
I need her to be herself. <laughs> what? Why, I mean, why are you even training her then? What's the, what's the point? I don't need Sabine to be a Jedi. I need her to be herself. No. What kind of garbage mumbo jumbo is this? Might I remind you that letting her be herself so far has only led to dropping the galaxy into mortal danger and getting herself stabbed. I don't know about you guys, but letting her be herself doesn't sound like the greatest idea. If she was a little bit more disciplined, if she was a little bit more like a, hmm, I don't know, a bit more like a Jedi, might not actually be so much of a bad idea. Oh, I just want her to be herself. Oh, piss off on a gap here, will you? Unfortunately, I won't be joining you for this one. And neither will the fleet. What? The Senate committee wouldn't approve the mission. The Senate committee? What are you talking about? You know, her boss. Actually, no, her boss's boss's boss. You know, you know, the big boss. Yeah, they said no. Why did we drop out of hyperspace so far from the planet? Standard Jedi mission protocol when approaching an unknown situation in order to avoid enemy surveillance. He's still doing this? Programming. Right. In but you, but you asked the question. What you, Hu Yang just very specifically answered the question that you asked. What are you, and now you're like, uh, he's still doing this, is he? Doing what? Being helpful? Oh, oh, so sorry. A little bit better than your contributions over the last couple of episodes, though, isn't it? Purple hair Armageddon gets stabbed a lot. Oh, yeah. What the, what the hell are you on about? Anyway, just before Ahsoka and crew have a chance to check out the big bad ring thing, the space commies turn up in their MIGs and ambush the party. Oh! Oh, no! If only Ahsoka would fly in a straight line and Sabine would shoot back at them and miss every single one of them. But then, through the power of self-belief, she learns how to use the gun properly. Spoiler alert. And then they spend a solid minute or two flying directly toward what at this point I can only assume is one of the Empire's most comprehensively armed assets without being completely obliterated. And look, if you've got a great big giant space sphincter outfitted with a whole bunch of laser cannons that can't even take down one female driver, I don't know what to tell you, you you're screwed. <laughs> Sorry. So. They somehow managed to survive, flying directly through the Empire's space anus. But the ship has lost power, so Ahsoka has to be a little more creative in order to defend the ship. Okay, I mean, I guess that's cool and all, but it's also completely ridiculous. I mean, they can still just shoot at the ship and blow the ship up. I mean, what's Ahsoka going to do? She's going to float about for a bit? No more problem. Why are they shooting directly at Ahsoka? You can still shoot at the ship. The ship blows up. Even if she survives that, she's just floating about. Wait, what, what? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! Ahsoka is wielding two specifically close range weapons. Every one of the enemies is outfitted with a long range weapon. So why on earth would you hand over the ginormous advantage of getting rid of that range in between you by flying directly to You don't need to go anywhere near them. You can just sit at a distance, shoot the ship, blow it up, problem solved. No more series. Why do you have to fly? That's like if Indiana Jones puts his gun down and just tries to fist fight that guy. Why would you do that? So they're going to be including Star Whales in this series, which, okay, could be cool, I guess. From what I can remember, Star Whales are these biological creatures that use hyperspace in order to migrate. And, you know, people studied and observed the creatures and then eventually developed the hyperdrive, which obviously then went into transports. So I imagine that the Empire are, like, plotting their migration paths in order to make intergalactic hyperspace travel possible. So, okay, yeah, th that could be cool, I guess. That could make for a good story arc. But apart from that, this episode suffers from the same problems as the first two, which is the main problem being time padding. I mean, this is a 36 minute episode. You know, we're not talking 40, 45, 50, 55 minute episode. This is 36 minutes. 
And about, what, five minutes of that is credits? So it, it's it's small and bloated at the same time, I, somehow. It's not a very, not a very dense show. But, uh, you know, time will tell if it gets any better. Join me next week if you want to see a review of episode four. There will be other videos in the meantime, hopefully. Uh, but until then, take care of yourselves, guys. And as always, a big shout out to the patrons and the channel members. We have the top tiers, Flunky, Pozzabon, Infinite, Dum Dum, Cost, Jax, David, ATS, Texas Lawman, Michael Terpia, Steve the Goat, Daggity69, nice, Digital EXE, and St. Nemo. To all of you, remember, uh, channel members, drop me a message. Patrons, I'll drop you a message because... YouTube don't actually let me directly contact members. But we'll find a way, and I'll get these sent to you. Again, thank you so much for being top-tier members. Really do appreciate it. And we have the Tier 2s, of course. Saeed, Dr. Melsky, Yarmwich, Hadziu, Kenneth Dogger, Machi, Mark Maiden, Sensei Fang, Mendicum, Bias, Michael S., Rich Welwick, Nystagmus, Manker and Jarek, the Grand Admiral, and Kidnap Tiger to each and every one of you. Thank you so much. And of course, a big shout-out to the Tier 1s as well. And we're welcoming Morton. Thank you very much for joining the Patreon, my friend. I have actually dropped you a passage. A passage? a message on Patreon. Uh, so make sure to go check that out, dude. Uh, but until then, take care. And uh, yeah, thank you very much to each and every one of you once again. And there we go, another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do, you intergalactic bitches. But until then, take care. And I'll see you very soon.